result. Uh, now, the, and uh, finally, uh, I'll mention that there is other evidence for a, a solar association. The Purdue people have their own experiment running in their laboratory in uh, wherever Purdue is, I forget now. It's Indiana. Indiana. It's Indiana, yeah. Uh, I forget the name of the city. But anyway, uh, they have found an association between fluctuations in the decay rate and solar flares. And uh, let's, go, go, let's go to the curve. So the, the green curve at the top, uh, or the blue curve, is their measurements of decay rates, uh, or actually the number of, uh, an integral of the number of, of counts. The green curve is a straight line, which with the, with the blue line would follow if the decay rate were constant. The red line is a measurement of X-ray data from flares, the measurement from a GO satellite that shows you when flares occur. And this is a, an expanded picture showing that uh, at times of certain flares, like this one, the decay rate has dropped significantly. Now what's really interesting here, if this is a real association, we need to check this. What's really interesting is that the decay rate begins to drop before the flare. And if this is a real phenomenon, it's going to be a, a predictive uh, process, that we have to predict when a flare is going to happen by monitoring uh, decay rates of elements. How could this possibly happen? Well, we know that flares that use magnetic fields uh, at the surface of the sun, um, in, in certain complex fields, will, in strong fields will give rise to flares. We know that the neutrino flux is influenced or can be influenced by the internal magnetic field. And so the interpretation would be that a very strong flux tube is bubbling up from deep down in the sun towards the surface. As it bubbles up, it begins to interfere with the flux of neutrinos, and that gives rise to a decay, to drop in the decay rate. When that flux tube arrives at the surface, this big complex flux tube begins to become unstable and gives rise to flares. So um, this is something that really needs to be followed up uh, very carefully. It's a great interest to the Air Force and probably other agencies too. Uh, this is where we are. I think it's a very exciting project. So to sum up, there's very strong evidence that the decay rates of radioactive elements does vary uh, with time. Uh, I believe there's good evidence that, that it varies in association with neutrino flux. But that is something that remains to be uh, further studied. Thank you. questions due to Peter's efficiency, <laughs> uh, but I will uh, exercise an honorary privilege and ask the first question, and you know you're very nice around here. Uh, it looks like here there are uh, several sharp spikes in this measure that yes. are not associated yes. with the problems in the Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, uh, It takes certain magnetic field configurations to influence internal magnetic field configurations to, 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 to influence the neutrino flux. And so it's quite possible that uh, certain flux tubes have the right orientation and the right strength to affect the decay rates. Other flux tubes have the wrong orientation or the wrong strength and they do not interfere with the, with the decay rate. Uh, has anybody looked into uh, the possibility of lunar blockage in the neutrino stream? As a matter of fact, I'm going to Amama Island in Okinawa State in Japan in July to do an eclipse, to take part in an eclipse experiment. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that uh, radioactive process And yet, we don't normally think of random processes as being modulated in any kind of systematic way. Um, and I'm just wondering 
in light of these data, do we need to reconsider how we interpret what a radioactive decay process involves if it's no longer functioning as if it's for an independent process? Well, can you repeat the question for the mic, please? Yes. Um, do we need to reconsider what we meet by a random process? Since we normally think of a random process as one that is a, a constant in time, a certain fixed uh, event rate in time, and here we have event rates that vary in time. And uh, I, I think uh, th there are probably in physics many, I mean, uh, in, in chemistry, uh, you, you have uh, chemical reactions going on. Uh, if you look at it in a microsecond time scale, it, it might be. Uh, look at random, look at it on a two-day time scale, it looks perfectly steady. So uh, I think that uh, there are many cases where phenomena, where uh, events occur that are random if you look at them on a short time scale, but not random if you look at them on a long time scale. I'll ask uh, further people asking questions to please speak up loudly so that the whole room can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Marsha. Paper. I want to compliment you on a very interesting paper, and I have a question and a comment. Uh, about 25 years ago, I did a massive screening of biological processes versus, versus solar flares, and I looked at tens of thousands of cases of violent spontaneous crime and uh, deaths by various means, and I kept getting a very persistent correlation with uh, the phenomena under observation with the day before the fire. Um, so perhaps uh, they have uh, often an explanation, and I'd like to comment that maybe not only uh, nuclear decay rates are affected, but maybe even biological processes uh, are a possibility. And the other thing I wanted to ask is, what are the implications for uh, the operation of atomic clocks, uh, if this is true, if this variability is true? Well, the second, what is the effect, what are the implications of, of, of atomic clocks? A good one, I mean, if the elements involved are elements which have been found to vary in time, uh, the decay rates, then obviously you have to be, you have to reconsider what you consider to be a stable clock. Uh, for the first point, I'd love to get hold of your data on these biological processes and compare them with neutrinos and other data. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, is anybody able to read punched cards anymore? <laughs> <laughs> they have museums with those pieces of equipment in them. <laughs> Buy from a museum. Not very stable. <laughs> <laughs> but we see uh, things in, uh, when we look out at the sky, we see things that, like novas and, uh, uh, and other processes maybe that we can't detect. Doesn't this really uh, call into question uh, some of our radioactive dating processes? Uh, if we don't know exactly what's gone on yeah. in the past? Yeah. Well, the question is, is this going to question our use of radioactive dating? And, uh, uh, possibly one has to look at the elements involved and look at this annual variation data and see if there's any, I think it, it means that we need to look much more closely at decay rate estimates. Um, what typically you see people uh, follow our decay rates for a year and uh, you know smooth things out and that gives an average decay rate or what they think is the decay rate. If you know decay rate varies in time, Obviously, you're going to have to take much longer measurements, much more carefully, and then in future you'll have to take into account time variation of decay rate. Is there any data then, a sort of follow-up question about uh, over thousands of years, has the neutrino rate changed? 